Welcome back to the Der Show. A lot has happened since the last time we got together, particularly um, Magistrate Judge Reinhardt's uh, decision, uh, which surprised a lot of people. Didn't surprise me. I predicted it and wrote about it in Newsweek magazine the morning he made the decision, hours before he made it. I predicted and urged him to do exactly what he did, and that is to say there is a general public interest in seeing as much of the affidavit that underlay the search of uh, Mar-a-Lago, as much of the affidavit as is consistent with the government's need to keep names and uh, sources of information, potential witnesses, um, uh, secret. Uh, That's exactly what he did. He rejected the government's view, and he rejected it again this morning. Government sought again to have uh, the entire affidavit uh, suppressed. He said no, and he said no uh, last week uh, as well, and he gave the government a week to come in and show him what has to be redacted. Now, obviously, we wait and see uh, what has to be redacted. Uh, I have seen just today uh, some affidavits in which virtually everything is redacted except the name of the affiant. Um, But I don't think uh, Reinhardt's going to do that. Uh, I think that uh, Reinhardt is going to look very, very carefully at what the government is alleging, and it will probably resolve doubts in favor of the government on the theory that, well, it'll become available at some point. The question is, does it have to become available now? There are going to be some hard questions. Look, if there are confidential informers that are working in Mar-a-Lago and secretly giving information to the government, of course that should be kept secret for two reasons. Number one, um, they can't continue to provide information if their identity is disclosed. Number two, there would be some threats, some dangers. We know that uh, people have uh, threatened and attacked, even FBI agents. These are good people, FBI agents. These are decent people with families who are just doing their job. They get a call, report to work. We're traveling down to Mar-a-Lago. We have a search warrant. We have to go to search. Don't attack them. Don't even criticize them. What do you want them to do? engage in an act of civil disobedience? No, this is not Hitler's time. This is not Mussolini's time. This is not Stalin's time. Uh, This is not Putin's time. Um, The FBI agents did the right thing. They went in and they searched. Did they search for too many things? Did they do the right thing going into um, Mrs. Trump's uh, closet? Those are questions that will, of course, be resolved. But up to now, I can tell you, Judge Reinhardt, seems to have done the right thing. Look, I, I don't know Judge Reinhardt. Uh, I may have met him. We're both, we both live in Florida and I get to Palm Beach from, from time to time. And I know several of the judges around the courthouse. I'd have no recollection of, of knowing him. Maybe, maybe I've met him, I don't know, but I have no stake in his um, reputation. Uh, I've just been objectively analyzing what he's done. And it seems to me so far, he's done exactly the right thing. He hasn't sided with the media who says they want everything. And he hasn't sided with the government who says they want nothing to be uh, produced. Um, The interesting question will be, aside from names of informers, possibly names of other witnesses, The government also says that it doesn't want to disclose information that will disclose its theory. Why? What's the secret about the theory? Why does that have to be protected? I don't get it. Um, Lawyers know the theory of the prosecution all the time. They're going to obviously find out about it. If there's an indictment or if there's any further uh, legal intrusion, why do we have to keep government theories secret what's there to be protected let the government lay out its theory let it say what statutes it's proceeding under we already know it's proceeding under the espionage act of 1917 the most hated statute of the 20th century ask any liberal civil libertarian left winger aclu member what is the worst statute in terms of civil liberties passed in the 20th century and they'll tell you it's the espionage act of 19 19- 17. That's the act on which they got Eugene V. Debs. That's the act on which they got uh, Emma Goldman and Berkman and uh, uh, Dr. Spock and you name it. Um, uh, Every civil libertarian hated the uh, Espionage Act of 1917 until now. Now they love it. 
they embrace it. They previously said it's too accordion-like. It's too easy to expand and contract. Now, the Larry tribes of the world are saying, expand it, expand it, expand it, expand it, make it bigger, make it wider. As long as you can get Trump, get Trump. As long as you can get Trump, that justifies everything. So that's one of their theories. One of their theories is he violated the Espionage Act. There are other theories. They're laid out in the search warrant itself, not the theories, but the statutes. Why shouldn't the government have to set out its theory? The government should have to explain what is it about the Espionage Act that was violated? Do you think that Trump was calling Putin and saying, hey, if you name a hotel after me in Moscow, I'll give you secret information that will help you win the war in Ukraine? That didn't happen. And if it did, what's the downside of letting us know it now so we could mock it, laugh at it, attack it and condemn the government for making such an absurd claim? Maybe it's true. If it's true, then we really have to go after uh, Donald Trump. But uh, that's not my point now, whether the government is acting truthfully or untruthfully when they allege violation of the Espionage Act of 1917. Why the secrecy? Why can't they let us know what their theory is? Are they just arguing that he should have given material over to the archives? Uh, that's a misdemeanor misdemeanor. That's that's even a small misdemeanor. That's like a, a violation. Uh, that's like a traffic stop. Um, if they know, if they said, no, there's this, this classified material there, um, we ought to know that. If they're saying it was declassified, but improperly declassified, we ought to know that. If they challenge the declassification, we ought to know that. What's the secret? If they say that it's worse that they that uh, Trump had in his possession important national security information which could be compromised by spies from China or Russia or you know what, um, uh, and, and they weren't kept securely enough. We ought to know that. What's the secret? Why hide it? I used to love a TV show when I was a kid. I've got a secret. I've got a secret. One of the best TV shows I ever saw was a version of I Got a Secret. None of you remember this because none of you are old enough to remember it. Maybe I got a couple of octogenarians out there who remember this. I watched uh, I Have a Secret show in about 1951. And the guy's secret, he sat there, he was a very old man. And everybody was guessing what his secret was. And they finally guessed it. He, this 90-something-year-old man, had actually witnessed the assassination of Abraham Lincoln by Booth in the theater in Washington, D.C. He was like a nine-year-old kid. His parents took him to a play. He saw everything. He saw Lincoln shot through the head. He saw Booth jump on the stage. He was an eyewitness. This happened in 1865. This was 1951 or two or something like that. And so he was old enough to have seen it. So I've got a secret, great television show, terrible governmental policies. Governments shouldn't have secrets unless they are necessary to national security, to the conduct of an investigation. I think I've said this before. I was one of the lawyers on the Pentagon Papers case. The Solicitor General of the United States, the former dean of the Harvard Law School, the man who hired me to teach at Harvard Law School, stood up in front of the United States Supreme Court and represented to the nine justices that if they allow the Pentagon Papers to be published, the nation will fall. National security will be deeply affected. Well, they did allow the Pentagon Papers to be published. They were published and nothing happened. The government was crying wolf. They cry wolf all the time. I have seen case after case after case like that where the government has demanded secrecy, not so much to protect the national security, but to protect their own incompetence their own uh, reputation, um, to increase their chances of winning a case. That's not a basis for keeping a secret, helping one side rather than the other win a case in an adversarial uh, system. Uh, after all, in, in, in most civil cases, you can't keep secrets. You can keep like, client secrets. But if I want to I hide my theory, you can't do it. You can't do it, even in criminal cases. The first thing I do, I'm just doing it today in, in a case 
involving the um, uh, breaking at the Capitol. A bill of particulars. I want a bill of particulars. Why do I want a bill of particulars? I want a bill of particulars because I want to know the government's theory. I want to know what the government is planning to prove so I can defend my client against it. What's the big deal about letting them know it now rather than later? We, the public, have the right to know. And I hope, although I doubt, here I'm predicting the opposite. I'm predicting that Judge Reinhardt, much as I admire him and what he's done up to now, I'm predicting that Judge Reinhardt will accept the government uh, approach to that and will say, oh, if it's a theory that the government is using and uh, they don't want the other side to know about it, uh, I I'm going to keep that secret. I think that would be a mistake. And if he does that, I'm going to criticize him. Um, the law, by the way, would be on his side, probably. But common sense is not on his side. And it also depends on how strong a presumption there is that in democracy, under the rule of law, transparency is the name of the game. We have to make sure that we remember that sunlight is the best disinfectant. And, you know, when you have a situation as we have now in the United States where, I don't know, close to half the country doesn't trust the other half of the country and doesn't trust the FBI and doesn't trust the Justice Department, transparency is essential to restoring uh, integrity and, and restoring uh, trust. Now, if the affidavit is revealed, it may prove that everything the government did was justified, that Trump has been howling in the wind, that, no, oh, no, this wasn't a raid, this wasn't unjust, government had a legitimate reason for doing this. I can't imagine what that would be myself. I can't imagine how urgent this was when they got the search warrant on Friday and then they went home for the weekend, had a picnic and you know, had a barbecue, took care of everything, and then leisurely way on Monday morning after they've had their holidays on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, they went and they conducted this urgent immediate search that required a search warrant and required them to go and look at Mrs. Trump's closet and a locked safe. I have great skepticism about that, and that's why I want to see the affidavit, but skepticism is not certainty. Maybe they had a basis for it. Maybe they had an informant who said that in the safe were national security items that could endanger the security of the United States. Maybe they had that. Maybe they had an informant, a maid who said, you know, Donald Trump used to hide this national security in his wife's panties. So you better search the panties because that's where they are. If, if they have that, hey, I'm going to be on their side. I'm going to support them. Uh, but if they didn't have that, or if they had it and it wasn't true, I mean, the safe is a perfect example. They probably had an informant who said there was stuff in the safe. Geraldo Rivera had an informant who said there was stuff in Al Capone's safe. <laughs> Turned out there wasn't. Um, and as far as I know from the reporting, there wasn't anything in Donald Trump's safe. So the best way of knowing who's right and who's wrong is to release the information. Now, there's another theory going around, and I just want to lay it out. I don't think it's true, but I want to lay it out, and, and maybe it is. And that is, there's a theory that says that Donald Trump really didn't want the affidavit to be made public. But he insisted that it be made public, thinking that that would lose. And that way, he it was a win-win. He would be saying, I want it out there in the public, knowing it wouldn't be out there in the public. And that Judge Reinhardt called his bluff and said, you want it out there? Fine, we'll put it out there. Because there's a risk. There's certainly a risk that the Justice Department could cherry pick the affidavit and say, paragraph one, that really hurts Trump. Let it stay in. Paragraph seven, no, 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 that, that doesn't help. Uh, but get Trump, it, it really uh, it makes the government look bad. Let's redact that. I would hope Judge Reinhardt would see through that. I would hope he would examine the affidavit very carefully, both the material that the government wants to redact and the material it doesn't want to redact, and ask them, what's the difference between this paragraph and that paragraph, except that one makes Trump look bad and the other makes the government uh, look bad. So we'll wait and see. But um, I'm hoping that by next Thursday, unfortunately, we're not on the air Thursday, but we'll be uh, back on the air soon after that. Um, but next Thursday or shortly thereafter, 
we should at least have parts of the affidavit. Um, I'm sure there'll be parts that aren't revealed and I'm sure there'll be an appeal either side, both sides will appeal. And the way it works is you appeal from the magistrate judge to the federal district court and then from the federal district court to the United States Court of Appeals, then from the United States Court of Appeals to the Supreme Court. And I think Judge Reinhardt, I, I, am, I am inferred from what he said today that if there were an appeal, he would probably stay the order. Now, I don't know whether he would stay under the following circumstances. Let's assume the government says nothing should be produced at all. And then it says, but if you're going to produce it, you should just produce this or that, not the other thing. And the um, government uh, loses and they have to uh, uh, produce. Um, will there be a stay for the entire affidavit? Because the government has taken the position none of it should be produced. I, if I were Judge Reinhardt, I wouldn't grant a stay for the whole affidavit. I would just grant a stay for those things which I ruled against, but which plausibly could relate to national security, could relate to the identification of informers or other witnesses. But uh, even on the issue of a stay, I would err on the side of transparency rather than on the side of, of secrecy. Well, we'll see what happens. We'll see. Um, uh, but I just want to end this segment of the show by saying one thing. Do not attack Judge Reinhardt. Do not attack FBI agents. Do not criticize people who are just working hard, people like you and me, people who have a family to support, people who are just doing their jobs. It's a big mistake to do that. Uh, the guy who went up to FBI headquarters uh, with an intent to do them harm, the guy who went to Judge Justice Kavanaugh's house with intent to do him harm. No, that, that's not the American way. You know, criticize or, Write a letter to me. I'll read it. Um, you know, hold a sign. Uh, but no violence, no violence, no threat of violence, no threat of civil war. I hear that all over the place. There, there could not be a successful uh, civil war, particularly if the um, administration against whom the civil war would be directed has control of the armed forces and the National Guard. Uh, so we're not going to have a successful civil war, but we may get some violence and that would be a shame. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's what's been going on with me on Martha's Vineyard writ large. In Martha's Vineyard, you know, there's intolerance. The people of Chilmark, the most, the, 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 the ones that have canceled me are just intolerant. They don't want to hear my point of view. They don't want to sit next to me even when I don't express my point of view. But the next step from intolerance is often violence. And there were some people on the vineyard that I think if they had an option to go after me violently might. I, when, when, when Larry uh, David uh, screamed at me, I, I thought he was going to have a stroke. If I had been right next to him, would he have pushed me and shoved me? I hope not. He was so angry. I mean, in his eyes and in his mind, he was looking at, this is his old friend uh, who's, who got his daughter, into, helped his daughter get into college. But he saw me as, as if not Hitler himself, as, as Hitler's enabler and assistant. He was so angry. It was so irrational. I almost felt pity for him that a person can't understand that there are two sides to an issue. And so we have that on the left with people like Larry David and others on Martha's Vineyard, Caroline Kennedy. And we have it on the right from people who want to attack uh, the FBI, want to attack judges. Just stop it. Don't do that. And stop writing nasty personal things about Judge Reinhardt com commenting on his who he represented, what his religion is, all of that. That's not America. What's American is criticize, criticize. That's your right, criticize. And, and, and people should take advantage of that right to criticize. All right, speaking of writing criticisms, let me read some of the letters that have criticized me. Um, so most of these now are from, um, from YouTube. Still have a few from Rumble, but you know the Rumble ones have a lot of those um, uh, just, just 
trolls who just write the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and, and YouTube letters on balance tend to be more thoughtful and more intelligent, but there's some thoughtful and intelligent ones on, on Rumble too. So keep writing to me, whatever, whatever the source is. Professor Dershowitz, since no one will debate you on certain law interpretations on political tactics and views, might you consider doing something like mock debates on YouTube with your son? Interestingly enough, um, he would be the, the producer. You know, there was a time for that. Remember CNN would have a show called Crossfire and uh, Buckley had a show and I used to debate him from time to time on it. And we debated live at Harvard. There used to be a time for debate. Today, Lincoln-Douglas debate couldn't occur. Half the country would say, we want to hear Lincoln, but not Douglas. The other half would say, we want to hear Douglas, but not Lincoln. Now, half the country says, we don't want to hear Dershowitz. And half the country says, we do. Uh, and it uh, depends on where you're located. If you're in Chilmark, Massachusetts, you can't hear me because the library won't have me. And usually, uh, until until recently, won't even, won't even carry my book. So, uh, yeah, I think it would be great to have a debate. Uh, Use them as critical thinking and educational material for your audience. I would love to listen to that. I learn a lot from and enjoy listening to your podcast. It would be great. It would be great to have a debate. And maybe someday my son, the producer, will set up a program where we can have um, uh, debates with uh, reasonable people. I mean, I'd love to debate some people on the right and some people on the left. I have a hunch that there'd be more people on the right that would be prepared to debate me, Ben Shapiro and uh, Megyn Kelly and others. They'd be prepared to debate me. Larry David, not a chance. I won't talk to you. You're disgusting. You once patted Mike Pompeo on the back. Yeah, he was my student and he did a great job on the, uh, on the Abraham Accords. Yeah, I patted him on the back. And if I saw him again tomorrow, I'd pat him on the back. But, oh, you're disgusting. You're disgusting. Remember one thing about Larry David. He is a terrible actor. And so what you see on his show <clears throat> is not Larry David acting. It's the actual Larry David, grumpy, annoying, intolerant. That's the real Larry David. That's the key to his success. He doesn't act. If he were a good actor, they would have put him in Seinfeld playing George. But they put a great actor in there. The guy who played George was a great actor. But Larry David is a crummy actor. And so he doesn't act. He just plays himself on television. Watch it. Next time you see Kirby Enthusiasm, if you watch it, I'm not going to be able to watch it anymore, but if you watch it, just understand he's not acting. That's really him. Okay. Professor Dershowitz, let us suppose that the warrant application regarding the search of Mar-a-Lago to Magistrate Judge Reinhardt was so deficient that his act in approving the application is embarrassing. Under these circumstances, Magistrate Judge Reinhardt might overrule the motion to unseal the motion for an improper reason to hide his own embarrassment. Would such a ruling be appealable? And the answer is yes, it would be. And if the judge wanted to do that, it would be very simple. All he had to do is deny the motion and say, no, I'm not going to reveal this. Come back to me in several months when this investigation further. But no, he said, I'm going to reveal it unless the government can persuade me that they're a thing. So I don't think he's embarrassed by what he did. From what I know, I read the search warrant, I read the uh, inventory, there seems to be probable cause, but um, we need more than that. Uh, probable cause constitutionally is enough to search, but the Justice Department doesn't base the decision whether to get a search warrant or a subpoena on probable cause. You can almost always get probable cause. You base it on whether there are exigent circumstances or a need for a more intrusive search warrant or it could be satisfied in a less intrusive way. That's what Attorney General Garland said. And let's see if the affidavit is revealed, whether or not he practiced what he preached. Okay. Professor Dershowitz, does the Constitution make any distinction between an impeachment and a criminal trial? If not, would double jeopardy protection apply to President Trump with respect to January 6th criminal charges? Terrific question. Really good question. And it's one of those questions that has a clear answer. A clear answer. This is not up for debate. The Constitution provides explicitly, no, there's no double jeopardy. You can be impeached. You can be convicted. Then you can be tried again in a regular criminal court and be sent to jail. The only question is whether you can be tried while you're president but the Constitution explicitly provides that you can be tried after your president. So the double jeopardy clause doesn't apply. 
Usually I don't like questions like that because the answers are too simple, but occasionally you get a question which there really is a right answer. Even Professor Tribe would have to acknowledge that that's right because there are some parts of the constitution that are not subject to interpretation. It's just clear. You can't run for president if you're 34. Yeah, you can actually run for president if you're 34. You just can't serve until you're 35. That would be very interesting if a guy was turning 35 or a woman on January 25th, ran for office one and just delayed inauguration five days, even though the constitution provides specifically for inauguration. That would be an interesting case. But a 30-year-old can't run for president. Uh, the 28-year-old can't run for the Senate. And a 23-year-old can't run for the House. There are specific provisions, how old you have to be. And those are binding. There's no interpretation. It's not the Chinese system of counting birthdays where you're one year old on the day you're born. It's the American system. So you have to be 35 actual years old to run for president. <clears throat> and if you're impeached and removed, you can be charged and prosecuted. That's the law. <clears throat> Here's a prediction, and it's wrong. This was made four days ago, so it must have been <clears throat> the day before Judge Reinhardt ruled. The judge will order the affidavit remain sealed if the Democrats did a good job finding a stooge judge. Well, I guess they didn't. Uh, they didn't find the stooge judge. Uh, they found an honest judge who did order that the affidavit must be revealed subject to some considerations. <clears throat> Here are some nice things. You're a national treasure. I know a great place to spend summers if you're ready for some new friends. Um, I appreciate that your loyalty to the Constitution, in spite of your political leanings, you can remain impartial. P.S. It's nice to see your smile back. I got my tooth. I got my tooth. I don't know how long it'll last, but I got my tooth. It's there. I don't look like Alfred E. Newman anymore. And no more criticism and comments about my tooth. I Everybody knows I have a face for radio. I never made it on my looks. I'm not going to make it on my looks, except with my wife. When I was giving a speech, that's how we met. She was in the audience. I was giving a speech and she thought I was cute. The next day she went to her ophthalmologist and had new glasses put on. But in any event, that's the only thing I've ever made <clears throat> on my looks. Sorry you're unpopular in Martha's Vineyard. It really shocks me how people react. Mrs. Kennedy was awful. I lost a friendship with one of my former law professors that I know for 20 years. Although I didn't vote for Trump, she no longer wanted to hear from me because I am conservative and still believe in equal treatment under the law. She also didn't like that I stuck to broad constructions of the First Amendment and that hate speech or supposed information should be allowed. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it's terrible. We shouldn't, we shouldn't have that. Uh, you know, again, I always say to my friends that still my friends in Martha's Vineyard, what if I actually became a Republican? I'm not. What if I actually voted for Trump? What if I actually supported him and contributed to him? Should that be enough to end the friendship? You can't be friendly with somebody who supported a candidate that you dislike. Um, my question to you who are Republicans out there, could you be friendly with people who supported uh, Hillary Clinton, who supported Joe Biden? I would sure hope so. I mean, I do have friends who voted uh, for, for Trump. I didn't. And uh, I, 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 I would vote against them again, uh, depending on who you ran against, of course. But that's not the basis on which you make friends. You are one of the greatest Americans of the century. Thank you. Thank you for continuing to speak out. Uh, wish you teach a new generation of lawyers online. You know, it's interesting because there are now online law schools as a result of, of COVID. Imagine you could reach a wide world for decades to come. I'm so glad your words and thoughts on current events are available to me, at least until you're potentially silenced and our constitutional republic dies. God help us. I'd love to do that. If somebody wanted me to give a class on constitutional law and criminal law, uh, to a worldwide audience on uh, Zoom, I'd, I'd be happy to do that for free. Um, I'm a teacher. I like teaching. Um, and uh, I taught 50 years, 10,000 students. Um, it's now, what, how many years since I retired? It's now about eight years since I retired. So, you know, it's been, it's been a while. And I did teach one class. Um, I taught a class at the University of Syracuse Law School 
by Zoom, because my daughter happened to be in the class. Um, but um, that's uh, um, okay. Are you still insisting that the Republicans will move to undo the right of contraceptives, gay marriage, interracial marriage as a result of nixing Roe, as you predicted? Or are you ready to admit that you were wrong, dead wrong? I certainly admit I was wrong if I said it, but you're wrong because I said the opposite. What I said and I wrote about it, I have, uh, I have a whole book coming out on it. Um, I said there's a big difference between rights with victims and victimless rights. Gay marriage is a victimless right. Um, contraception is a victimless right. Interracial marriage is a victimless right. Abortion is a closer question for those of us who believe that a woman should have the right to abort a fetus. It's a victimless right. For those who believe that um, abortion is killing, it's, it's a right with a victim. For those who believe, as I do, that there's a difference between a day-old zygote and an eight-month-old viable fetus, these are all matters of degree. But I never believed, and I don't believe, that the Supreme Court will overrule gay marriage, interracial marriage, and, 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 and contraceptives. I've said that from the beginning. There's an enormous difference. Uh, Justice uh, Kavanaugh said it in his concurring opinion. I, what I said was there will be efforts by Republicans to do that, but I think those efforts will fail. We'll see. So I've made a prediction. You can judge me on it. See you tomorrow.